I shall fulfill my duty to maintain international peace and order and rigidly adhere to the code of conduct. By cultivating virtue, training my mind and body, and polishing my skills, I shall not take part in political actions and shall maintain a sense of responsibility, giving my undivided attention to the completion of my mission. I swear never to shy away from danger, but to risk my life in accomplishing my duty and to fulfill my responsibility to humanity. UN Forces Oath of Service World War II was considered humanity's deadliest war before the Beta invasion. The conflict left Europe in ruins, with millions dead across the Eurasian continent. Following the war, World governments revisited the League of Nations, an idea first proposed by American President Woodrow Wilson in 1918. This proposition was to form an international assembly in which member states would gather to discuss world events and solve problems between nations through diplomacy. Given how the world was still reeling from the horrors of the Second World War, the idea stroked the hearts of the populace and government leaders. Thus, in 1945, the United Nations was born, its goal to be a peaceful organization promoting cooperation and world stability. Through the UN's inception, steps were made towards world peace, but without a common enemy to unite them. Two prominent members began eyeing each other with contempt. The US and USSR would come out as the world's two superpowers, eventually leading to a divided world between the democratic West and communist East. Almost like a bad omen to the future of humanity, the world entered a period known as the Cold War. The two belligerents' military did not actively engage one another. Instead, it was a battle of economics and proxy wars. Smaller countries backed up by either East or West engaged in isolated conflicts. Throughout this tumultuous time, the UN was powerless as its two most prominent members did all but defy the purpose for which the United Nations was formed. However, in 1967, with the Beta invasion of the Moon, the UN shifted from mediators between nations to a proactive military force. Constructed under Article 43 of the UN Charter, the world would form a military arm with the United Nations labeled as the UN Forces. Obtaining personnel and equipment from member nations, this newly formed army would comprise the bulk of the force fighting in the Lunar Wars. Now formed under the name of the UN Space Force or simply UNSF, they would engage in dogged fighting on the moon. Ultimately, despite the UNSF's best efforts, the Beta would begin their invasion of Earth in 1973. During the opening salvos of what would later become the Great Beta War, the UN was once again set aside as individual nations fell back into personal alliances fighting independently of the UN forces. During that time, UN forces were only made up of borrowed military personnel from member nations. With Beta forces spreading further and further across Eurasia, the UN Chiefs of Staff Council held a conference in Vancouver in 1979. Through this conference, UNCSC began exerting control of their borrowed forces during operations as deemed necessary. Throughout these tumultuous times, humanity kept losing more and more territory to the Beta. Individual nations found it harder and harder to maintain their own military forces. UN Command seized this opportunity to permanently incorporate these now nationless armies into their military. In a twist of irony, 
Continual loss of individual nations to the beta grew the UN's military presence in terms of equipment and personnel. Though of course, to avoid having this growing military force swayed by political agendas, all personnel of the UN forces swore an oath of service, where their loyalties were first and foremost to humanity. As a result, UN armed forces became a superb military on Earth, garnering forces and technology to potentially rival any singular nation. By 2001, the UN forces are divided into six regional commands, additionally with the UNSF and naval fleets totaling 3 million personnel. These regional commands are tasked with organizing and preparing for the eventual counterattack against the Beta and the retaking of the Eurasian continent. They are split into the Arctic, Atlantic, Mediterranean, Indian, Antarctica, and Pacific Ocean Regional Commands. These armies are responsible for assisting the remaining countries in repelling Beta incursions and partaking in culling operations in Eurasia. As a show of support against the Beta, UN Atlantic Regional Command organized Operation Neptune in 1983. The main objective of the operation was to relieve the pressure from the Oder Nysa defense line. This was the first major operation under the UN's banner that resulted in a rousing success. Operation Neptune was spearheaded by the UN's first Atlantic expeditionary fleet. Although each individual nation maintained their own separate chains of command, the UN-backed plan proved its effectiveness by overseeing the first major operation against the Beta since Operation Paleologos in 1978. Since Operation Neptune, the UN has been active around the globe assisting member nations in repelling Beta incursions. Of the regional commands, a few have gained notoriety for their actions on both the battlefield and political stage. Of note, the UN's first forces of the Mediterranean Sea Regional Command were key in the defense of the United Kingdom in 1985. Additionally worthy of mention was the UN's 44th Cerberus Tactical Armored Battalion. They were key in repelling the Beta back into the English Channel. However, the UN is not without its faults and is also responsible for failed operations resulting in tremendous loss of life. Such as Operation Swaraj in 1992, where Indian Ocean Regional Command First Forces along with Far East Forces failed to take the Bhopal Hive in India. Though they failed to take the hive, it did deliver a hard enough blow to allow the Indian Front to withstand another two years against the Beta. With this in mind, notoriety comes with recognition and infamy. For example, post-Operation Swaraj, the UN forces tried two additional hive capture operations that ended in failure with a great cost of life and resources. Taking the brunt of these losses was the UN's Orbital Divers Corps, with the six orbital divers in particular at the head of drops on the Leon and Mandalay hives. Such high casualties among the divers comes with a tragic statistic. On average, they do not survive past their third drop. Failures like these cost the UN and their host nations resources, resulting in friction between parties involved. This strenuous relationship can be seen between the UN forces on the European front and among EU forces. Many military personnel that have lost their homelands to the Beta are heavily reliant on the UN. This reliance on the UN and utilization of local forces as a first line of defense against the Beta has caused animosity between the UN and its member nations. But the fact remains that without UN support, the EU cannot maintain the European fronts. That reality is both a great source of cooperation and indignation for the EU. However, across the Pacific, 
Far Eastern forces have their own tumultuous relationship with the UN. During 1997, the Beta established a hive in Sherwan, Korea, completing the Beta's hold on Northeast Asia. This led to the evacuation of South Korea, where the Imperial Japanese Army and the UN clashed ideologically. UN Pacific Ocean Regional Command wanted to safeguard all military assets for safe evacuation from South Korea. Despite this choice by UN Command, the IJA instead held the line, giving civilians much needed time to evacuate the doomed nation. This defense resulted in considerable material loss for UN and IJA forces. As a result, the UN demanded the commander of the IJA forces be tried for dereliction of duty. This incident started the rough relationship between the UN and IJA. Following the fall of Northeast Asia, the Beta began a full-scale invasion of Japan in 1998. Half the country had fallen before Operation Lucifer in 1999. The US dropped an experimental WMD on the Japanese mainland without permission from the Japanese government. On paper, this was the first successful major counterattack against the Beta, as the Japanese mainland was secured along with the first ever capture of a reasonably intact Beta hive. But the use of a strategic weapon on their own soil without their consent permanently soured relations between the Japanese people and the UN and US forces. The current state of affairs has shown humanity the most united it has ever been. Despite this, human nature is not so easily forgotten. The world maintains a sense of mistrust for the UN over its major backer. The United States is currently the only superpower left in the world of Muvlov. They have, for 30 years, remained virtually untouched by the Beto's relentless advance. With their infrastructure intact and resources untouched, the US became the main supplier for the UN. It is also responsible for providing most of the world with TSFs. As such, most nations look upon the UN as an amalgamation of the US government exerting control outside their borders. Particularly, this vision is held by ultranationalists within the Imperial Japanese Army after Operation Lucifer. The Soviets and EU hold similar views, but it should be noted despite the opinions behind closed doors, UN and US forces constantly fight side by side with the world's remaining armies to combat the Beta. By 2001, the UN is the biggest army in the world. It is a multinational force spread across the globe and even the Earth's orbit. While it has had troubles in its long years of existence, the UN is still proof that mankind can come together and defend humanity against insurmountable odds. Whether it be in the European theater or the far eastern shores of Southeast Asia, their organization has fought across the globe to defend mankind from the Beta's relentless assaults. As such, the UN stands as a beacon amongst the darkest hours of humanity, fighting ever onward to secure humanity's future.